Welcome back. I'm Rich Struess. And I'm John Baker. And this is the third and final showcase from the Center for Threat Informed Defense. And now we're going to be focusing on defensive measures and collaborative research and development projects from the center that are going to help defenders. So uh, if you're uh, just joining us for the first time, a brief, uh, a brief overview of the Center for Threat Informed Defense. If you've been with us for the other sessions, a quick review. Uh, the center is a privately funded research and development center at MITRE Ingenuity that works with 30 member organizations, the leading security teams from companies from around the world to identify gaps and problems in the threat informed defense ecosystem, and then works to develop projects that will fill those gaps and address those problems. To date with our 30 members, we've published 13 research and development projects that really span a wide array of uh, topic areas uh, but the key thing to know about center research and development and why we're talking about it here today is that all of the center's research and development is made freely available globally. And that's really only possible due to the generous support of the center's members. Uh, so if you think about the center and our collaborative R&D program, uh, we have 13 projects that have been released to date. And those projects uh, really run from everything like adversary emulation libraries, which we uh, talked about in the previous session, uh, threat intelligence related uh, projects, uh, which we talked about in our first session. And so in this session, we're gonna focus on what are those projects that are gonna create resource, that create resources that are helpful for defenders who are trying to answer uh, a really fundamental question. And that is what defensive measures, what defensive capabilities, what control frameworks, what product capabilities um, are available to me as a defender that will that I can use to relate to given adversary behavior to prevent or detect or remediate uh, that adversary behavior. So we're going to dive into a few of those projects right now, starting off um, with uh, this data 53 controls to attack and I'll turn that over to John. Yeah, thanks, Rich. Um, this was also one of our earlier projects in the center's research program. And I think um, as we started down the path of, of developing out a set of mappings between the controls identified in NIST 853 in attack, um, we ended up kind of laying a foundation for a number of follow-on projects, which Rich and I are going to talk with you about next. Um, where we're trying to help uh, defenders understand, as Rich said, how different capabilities, different resources can help them uh, protect or you know, mitigate threats that they care about, right? And so with this particular project, um, you know, what we found and, and heard over and over with our center participants is that, you know, um, organizations all around the world, I, looked 853 and the set of controls identified there. Um, some of them are required to implement 853. Some of them just leverage it as a reference point, um, but it's used all over the place. And um, there's really wasn't any set of um, you know, well-documented defined um, relationships between the set of controls identified in NIST 853 and the set of real world behaviors that adversaries use to achieve their goals as described in the MITRE ATT&CK knowledge base. Um, so when we took on this project, we realized, you know what, we're not the first organization to try to create a mapping between 853 and ATT&CK. In fact, lots of organizations have done it. Lots of teams, security teams have done that mapping internally on their own. Um, and, you know, the, the thing is that all of those were done within security teams and kind of done as like, you know, independent initiatives. What we wanted to do was uh, create a baseline set of mappings that the whole community could use um, and that security teams around the world could take and build upon and tailor and, and use on and make on their make their own. Right. And to do that, what we had to do was um, you know, obviously develop the mappings, but if you really want to make those mappings valuable, you kind of have to recognize it's a subjective process. And so you'll see this theme across 
the different mapping projects that we're going to talk about where you know we we develop some mapping some relationship between attack and some other resource but we've also tried to capture a methodology and a set of resources um tools to help it help you as a user make use of those the methodology for us is really critical because we're doing something that's highly subjective defining the relationship between these two different resources and um to me to us the the thing we can do to kind of um, make that content widely usable is tell you how we arrived at those conclusions, explain to you the decisions that we've made so that you can take that content and tailor and adjust based on your organization's uh, perspectives. Um, so we completed this project and it led to a series of follow on projects uh, related to connecting attack to other resources. And I'll hand it over to Rich to talk about the next project. And so with this, um, this project, we, uh, we really trying to, to uh, solve a slightly different problem. Those of you are familiar with the Verizon uh, data breach uh, report, the DBIR, as it's known, um, probably are aware that uh, underlying that uh, report and its methodology is a, um, is a framework called Veris, uh, which Verizon developed <clears throat> and used to organize the data that goes into uh, their analysis that undergirds the DBIR, and you know, Veris is a is a really interesting framework that's really oriented around sort of the the more strategic as aspects of a cyber incident. Um, you know, it it gets into some technical detail, but where uh, Veris really shines is in quantifying and characterizing uh, the impact and the assets involved and the actors. And what we saw was a natural opportunity to, bridge, to create a bridge, really, between two very uh, important and successful frameworks that each do something different. Um, so what we wound up doing is creating a project with the support of uh, the the center members you see listed on the slide uh, to build that bridge uh, between Veris and Attack. So whereas Veris says that is really good at describing the impact of an incident. Um, you know, so you can you can start to understand why do we care about this from a sort of strategic or a financial perspective. Uh, it doesn't have the kind of technical detail that Attack has. Attack really good at talking about the adversary TTPs uh, with a, a fair degree of specificity. So Attack's great for characterizing, you know, the adversary did this and then did this and then did that to achieve their objective. But Attack sort of by by design doesn't really get into the so what of, a, of any given uh, chain of uh, techniques. So uh, one of the, th so, so to us, the, uh, the clear direction was to create a bridge that would allow people to better integrate attack data and Varus data together. And that's what this project has done, creating these attack to Varus mappings, um, which allow you to connect individual uh, attributes and properties in the Veris framework to the MITRE attack techniques and sub techniques that they correspond to. And by doing this and doing it once well, uh, you know, our goal is then, you know, if, to make it easier for people to, to do that crosswalk, whether you're starting with a Veris data set and you want to map it over to attack, or whether you're starting with an attack data set and you want to begin the process of characterizing it in Veris, we think this is a really important tool. Again, it's a resource that we make freely available, and we encourage you to use it and uh, help us improve it. the The next project, you know, sort of also in the same vein of connecting two really big and important and popular things, uh, but here uh, we're talking about uh, CVE, and the interesting origin story of this project. Is, um, is one of our, our members early on in the center's uh, lifetime uh, came to us and said, I need a way to better integrate our threat environment inside of our organization with our vulnerability organization. We need to have more connective tissue between the two organizations and we need to have some technical underpinning for that. And uh, John, John and his team uh, did a great job of putting together this project that ultimately wound up creating a methodology 
and a specific set of mappings as a proof of concept to show how you can take and map attack techniques to particular uh, vulnerabilities as described in CVE. And the whole purpose of this uh, approach is to allow people who use this methodology to go from a new CVE is published to answering the question, what adversary behavior is impacted or empowered by or enabled by this vulnerability? And with that information, with the ability to now say, we have a CVE, which has its, you know, which is really just focused on the vulnerability itself. And we can combine that with contextual information about here are the specific adversary behaviors that either this vulnerability allows or that are enabled by it. You all of a sudden have a really powerful set of context, uh, contextual pointers um, to help answer that age old question, what what's the priority of any given CVE? And, you know, where things like CVSS scores, um, the, you know, and exploitability indices that are really, uh, that are important as well. But this idea of being able to add context about here's the adversary behavior that potentially relates to this CVE. Then when a CVE comes out, you do this mapping, you apply this methodology, um, you know, if, for example, it allows or enables uh, adversary behavior that you have well in hand, that you have robust protections on, then maybe this vulnerability is slightly less high priority for you to patch. Um, but if, in fact, that vo this new vulnerability uh, is allowing or enabling adversary behavior that uh, you don't have robust prevention or detection on, that can really help you appropriately prioritize that that's a vulnerability that needs to be patched as soon as possible. Um, so you know this, again, takes the form of a methodology that you can apply. Uh, we did a uh, set of mappings of uh, CVEs from last year that uh, show you uh, you know, how the methodology can be applied. And we encourage you to uh, incorporate this into your workflows. And um, sort of following that theme of, you know, helping people understand how different capabilities uh, allow them to uh, mitigate the threats that they care about as described in the attack knowledge base. Um, I, uh, I, I, really, I really love this project and kind of the origin story here. Um, I th thought I would start by just sharing that with you all, because uh, it, it shows a little bit about how the center's research program works. Um, for those of you that were able to join us this morning for our first uh, showcase, we I talked a little bit about uh, the project that helped kind of evolve and advance Attack for Cloud. Um, so as, as we kind of got towards the end of that project, and we could see what the outcome was going to be there. Um, one of our center participants reached out to me and, and, you know, just kind of expressed their sort of happiness with the work that was done there and that kind of like seeing the value in that. Um, but they still had this problem. And, and the gist of it was like, hey, can you help me figure out the so what for attack for cloud? And so we worked with this participant to try to unpack that and figure out, like, you know, what do you mean here? What, what, what's the problem you're, you're trying to tackle? And what we learned was they were in the middle of a migration to um, a major cloud platform. And now they had helped us uh, by sponsoring um, to advance the attack for cloud matrix. And, you know, so now they have a better understanding of the threats that they might care about in cloud environments. They want to understand how the native security capabilities of the cloud environment that they were moving to would, would help them defend against those threats. And um, kind of digging into that more, you know, they were trying to figure out, does the cloud environment I'm moving to have security capabilities to defend against the threats I care about? Do I need to develop my own in-house detection capabilities to support uh, the you know, identifying and detecting the threats I care about? Do I need to buy third party tools and, and you know, bring in third party resources to help me? Um, and so at the end of the day, what that turned into was a project that 
aspired to help um, organizations understand how the native security uh, capabilities of major cloud platforms stacked up against the threats that they care about as described in attack. Um, so we started out referring to this work as cloud security stack mappings. Our first project focused on Microsoft Azure. We then went and had a follow-on project that tackled um, Amazon Web Services. And uh, I'm really excited because we're, we're getting ready to kick off a third project that's going to um, essentially do the same thing and, and look at the security capabilities of the Google pl Cloud platform. Um, when we're done, all three of these uh, major cloud platforms will have their security capabilities that are kind of baked in, their native security controls mapped back to um, enterprise attack. Um, and so this gives us this foundation for um, really the global community that's leveraging these cloud platforms to um, kind of dig into and help them understand as they make those decisions. Um, so some of our core use cases that were motivating this work were, as I said, just basically trying to understand the, the, the coverage of the native security capabilities for a given platform. Um, as I mentioned, you know, that initial conversation from our center participant, trying to better understand, you know, what of those native security controls they should implement and how they should implement them, right? Um, and then further, you know, trying to kind of filter that into their risk management process um, as they're making big decisions about moving capabilities into cloud environments. Um, and then, you know, based off of that, uh, where should they be investing in developing or acquiring additional um, capabilities? And so I see there was an audience question, um, just to be clear, if you missed that, um, the work to map the Google Cloud Platform is in the pipeline. Um, we're just getting ready to kick that project off. Um, so it should be coming to you uh, in the springtime. Um, so what I wanted to do next was actually jump over to my browser and just show you some of these resources um, rather than uh, present them in slides. Um, so, you know, once again, it's all available up on the Center for Threat and Form Defense's website. Um, easy way to find all of our work. So you navigate over to our work. Um, I'm going to just pick on uh, the security stack mappings for Azure um, for this kind of walkthrough, but just wanted to make sure you also were aware there's uh, parallel capabilities and resources available for the AWS uh, mappings as well. So if we jump in here, You'll see that basic landing page. Um, we tried to make it really easy for uh, users to find the res like the majority of users to find the resources that they need. So the first thing you'll see here is um, a set of mappings um, between those as your security capabilities and attack. Um, so uh, web page opens up there. You can quickly see. Um, this aggregate attack navigator layer. Um, it'll take a second for the navigator to load. Um, I won't walk you through all of this, but uh, just understand there's a legend here that explains the color coding, and you can get a quick glimpse at the high level coverage of the native security capabilities um, in Azure uh, for the set of enterprise attack techniques. I'm going to close out of there for a second. And then um, let's see, I, I like to pick on I think this is one of my favorites to pick on. So if you jump into any given control, I picked here the advanced threat protection for Azure SQL database. What we've tried to do for that control, we give you an attack navigator layer. We give you a basic description of the control. Um, and then for the set of techniques that um, that capability is able to help you mitigate, we've um, defined a set of categories and a, a score or a value for our mapping there and we've provided comments. We've put a lot of time and effort into developing these comments because kind of as I said with the 853 mappings, there's some subjectivity um, and uh, if we want organizations to be able to take this resource and use it to make decisions, um, there's oftentimes places where it's like, well, you need to configure you know, this capability in this way for it to be effective. Um, so we've tried to capture all of that um, additional context um, the, the rationale for our, our decisions in these comments, any uh, 
um, things you might want to think about or be aware of in terms of configuring the capability um, are all in these comments as well. And so obviously, if we were to scroll through here, you see this long list of the security capabilities that we mapped for Azure. So we tried to make that high level resource essentially a, a HTML catalog of the security capabilities that we felt were in scope um, as part of uh, Azure mapped to attack and our rationale and explanation for those mappings. Um, for the more advanced users, what we've done is we've made all of the documentation that supports, um, explains our methodology available up on our Git repository. Um, so here you'll see uh, sort of a, a master Git repository um, with documentation describing our overall methodology. Um, and then there's a folder of mappings. I mentioned AWS and Azure. They're both there. Same set of tools, resources, methodology applied to both um, cloud platforms. Oops, I went back one too many. Sorry. Um, and so if we jump back to the, the top level documentation, I just want to show you um, the overall methodology that we use and kind of explain how we've gone about uh, doing these mappings. Um, so if you look through our Git repository, um, you'll find this uh, methodology document. Um, the way we've looked at things is for any cloud plat any platform that we wanted to map or security capability we wanted to kind of map back to attack, the first thing to do is um, uh, essentially an analysis of that capability to identify the, the relevant security controls there. Um, so for each platform, that means we've we've made a, a decision and we've then documented that decision. You know, this is the set of capabilities that we're going to focus on. Um, we then do an analysis of each individual capability, trying to understand kind of the basic type of capability or category or, or like functional category of that capability. Um, and uh, kind of go uh, with each step a little bit more detailed, kind of digging in to better understand how that capability functions. Um, based on that information, we then look over at the attack corpus to understand, okay, based on the functional category um, and the sort of resources this capability is trying to protect, what attack techniques um, should we be looking at as kind of in scope here? Um, from there, we do the analysis to understand, okay, for that set of in-scope attack techniques, um, what exactly is this capability doing here? Um, and that allows us to come up with these score assessments and then eventually create a mappings file. Um, so that HTML document that I just walked you through is all um, based off of this underlying um, YAML data model and for each control that we've mapped, we have a little YAML file. And uh, I'll show you one just to so you believe me that they're there. Um, if I were to pick this example here, you can see our YAML with um, the basic information about that capability, version information, so you know what version of attack it was we used when we did that mapping, comments explaining the mapping. All of that information is here. Um, so what we then did on top of this was we created um, a set of tools that will allow us to take that YAML, generate attack navigator layers, generate HTML representations or other representations of that data. Um, and uh, the net result is that we have one repository here where uh, the community can come, understand our approach, understand um, hopefully why we've mapped things the way we've mapped them, um, access the underlying mappings uh, through you know, basic HTML representations of it or um, through a command line interface that allows for searching and manipulation of the data. Um, we're looking to continue to build upon our mappings work. So I'm gonna jump back to our slides here. Thank you. Um, and jump ahead because I covered all of this. Yeah, so I'll jump to there. Um, so what you can start to see is we've laid this foundation of uh, security controls mapped to attack techniques. We focused on AWS, Azure to start with. We're gonna tackle uh, the Google Cloud Platform next. We've been working with our central participants to 
define a roadmap for other capabilities that we want to focus on within our center research program. But we also recognize that the center's research program probably can't map everything for everybody. Um, so that's why it's been really important that we document what we're doing, because ultimately we want to give you and the security community and the um, security vendor community the ability to apply that methodology and develop um, uh, mappings that are um, sort of in the same spirit and, and similar to the ones that we've developed here. Um, it's, it's a large undertaking to map all of these different security capabilities. And we'd love to get together as a community to, um, to map those capabilities and share the results of those mappings so that we can all have a better understanding of how these security capabilities that are available to us help us defend against the threats that we care about. So I see a couple questions from the audience. And I think we have three or four minutes here. Um, it's going to jump over to one. I see there was a question about the CVE mappings um, being mapped back to attack. Um, and I'll answer that, but if it wasn't obvious, feel free to paste in questions and uh, we'll try to answer a couple with the last couple minutes of our session here. Um, so the question is, is there a bigger list of CVEs mapped to attack besides the, the 800 plus? Um, at this point, there isn't. We developed that set of CVEs mapped to attack as a way to um, really develop and validate the methodology that we created. Um, one of the, the, for that work to be truly impactful, what we're continuing to do is engage with the vulnerability research community to kind of make the case for adopting and using that methodology. Um, we've been working with the CVE community to um, get some changes made to the underlying data structure that uh, is used to describe CVEs. So if you go to cve.org, um, you can kind of you can search through the CVE corpus, but you'll find links towards the underlying data model there. It now has an ability to um, represent an attack technique reference. And so with that, we've laid a foundation for the community to start to build upon the set of mappings that we have here with their, their own mappings and apply the methodology. I think that might be the only other question I see here through the chat history. Yeah, I think that's the, the last question I see. Um, so in the last uh, couple of minutes, I just wanted to make a couple of points about uh, the R&D that we've talked about across the three sessions today. Um, first of all, None of this work would be possible without the center's participants, without our members that have uh, funded this work, that have given us their ideas, that have collaborated with us throughout the execution of these projects. Um, so, uh, you know, we we all owe them uh, our thanks for making these available, these resources available to the global community free of charge. Uh, another thing that I think binds all these projects together is. Uh, and I hope you agree, and if you don't, please let us know and we'll work to improve it, is that all of these projects have created resources that you as a practitioner can pick up and use today in your work. You know, we think it's really important, uh, whether we're advancing the state of the art or the state of the practice, that we do it in a way that is accessible to the vast majority of the community. So ultimately, you get the final say on that. So if you, if you like what you, you see, let us know. If you don't like what you see, uh, that's even more important that you let us know. Uh, you know. You can send us emails, you can file issues up on the various GitHub repositories, um, but please let us know, because our goal is ultimately to empower defenders uh, out there uh, to, to change the game on the adversary. Uh, we encourage you to uh, keep in touch with us we're constantly adding new uh, projects. We're constantly releasing new projects. We're gonna be releasing a couple of more in the next uh, month or so. Uh, you can sign up for our mailing list uh, to get uh, advanced notification of projects uh, if you uh, go to the center's website. Uh, and with that, I wanna thank you all for the time and attention. I'm excited to say that our final session now uh, is Steve Luke and Frank Duff, who are going to be closing out this event 
uh, with some important announcements and some final thoughts. So please join me over there. Yep. Thank Thanks you. All. Thank <laughs> you.